We just heard from your colleague, Bernard Jenkin. He says that Dido Harding uh, should effectively be sacked as the head of Test and Trace. Do you agree? No, I'm afraid I don't agree. I think that what Dido has done is put together and drive forward a team that has come on so much in the last few months. We have got a scheme that's gone from having no test and trace, obviously before the virus, to building up a scheme now that means we've tested over, almost over 28 million people. That's more than anywhere else in Europe. 1.1 million people now who have been contacted through the scheme. We want to see it improve, we want to see it grow and get better and better. That's how we fight this virus. But actually, I think Dido and the team have done a very good job to get to where we are. Very good job. We've spent £12 billion so far on Test and Trace. That's more than we spend on nurseries and universities in a year. And yet SAGE, the scientific advisors, say it's having a marginal impact on transmission. The chief scientific advisor says it's very clear there's room for improvement. I mean, it's not exactly a success, is it? Well, look, we agree, and the Prime Minister himself said this week, we want to see it improve, as I just said myself. We want to see this develop and grow, but I also just would say, Sophie, be really careful around some of the figures. The 12 billion figure you just quoted is actually for the whole testing scheme. It's not just that tracking part of test and trace. It's, it's a bit misleading to suggest it's just that. It's much wider. And as I say, that is a scheme in the name. that has now Who's tested more name? here than anywhere else in Europe. Um, it's test and trace, the, the clues in the name, testing and tracing. Um, a submittee of SAGE said in April that a successful the contact, contact tracing, tracing is wrong. system would require around 80% of contacts to be traced and isolated rapidly, i.e. within two days. So if that's what the level that it needs to be working uh, effectively, successfully, when was the last time test and trace reached 80% of people's contacts? Well, as the Prime Minister said this week, we want to see it improve. I would just say, Sophie, look, you're quite right. That cost is around test and trace, but it's wrong to suggest it's the cost of contact trace. It's not. It's the whole programme of work that, as I say, is one of the biggest, if not the biggest now, in Europe. We do want to see it improve. That's why we're putting more support in to ensure that we've got more robotics, more people, more laboratory capacity to see it get to the level we want it to be. Ultimately, we will beat this virus, but all of us with our self-responsibility, particularly if we've tested positive, making sure that we isolate in the way that the guidance outlines. So the question I asked was, when was the last time that Test and Trace reached 80% of contacts? It didn't reach 80% of contacts since the 17th of June. It's been falling since then. It hit a new low of just 59% of contacts uh, in the most recent weeks. I mean, on Sage's own definition, that is not a successful Test and Trace system, is it? Well, as I say, and as the Prime Minister said, we want to see it improve. Of course, we are testing more and more people, some 360,000 test capacity, 340,000 tests completed on the last day's figures, getting to half a million by the end of this month. So that's been growing exponentially. We want to see the other part of the system catching up so it can get back to doing that 80%. That's why we want to see that system improve, as we've outlined ourselves just this week. I understand why the government is keen to emphasise the number of tests that we're carrying out. And as you say, you know, compared to lots of European countries, we are carrying out an awful lot of tests. But that only matters if people get the results back in a timely way. And actually, if you look at the latest statistics, the most recent week, just 15% of in-person tests were received within 24 hours. I mean, it's no point testing all these people if they're then just wandering around for 48 hours spreading the virus. Well, actually, I disagree with you there. I think, first of all, it is important that we test people. That's why I think it's right that we are clear about the fact we're testing more than anywhere else in Europe. When people get the result of their test, whether it's within a day or less or occasionally, sadly, taking that 48 hours, that's when people need to, once they're clear they've got symptoms, people should be isolating anyway. If somebody's had a test and then proves positive, they should be isolating following the guidance. That's what we've all got to do in terms of our own self-responsibility. So increasing the testing is hugely important. What we also want to see, as I say, as we've outlined this week, is an improvement in the other part of the system, seeing that contact work increase, the speed of the testing results come through more quickly. And that's why we're looking to increase the capacity on that side with more laboratory capacity as well. My colleague Ed Conway uh, recently revealed uh, that the government is paying multi-million million pound wages to, for people to work on the test and trace system. So executives from Boston Consulting Group pay day rates of about £7,000. That's equivalent to an annual salary of £1.5 million. And this is a system that, in your own words, needs improvement, that you'd like to see improvement. Is that really value for money? Well, we've had to work quite, I think it's quite right that the government's been working across the public sector and with the private sector as well, trying to bring the very best expertise to a virus that, as you said, 
at the beginning, Sophie, is a new virus. This is unprecedented. We're all learning more and more as we go forward. We're looking to improve and develop the way we respond to that virus as we move forward. That's why things have been able to change in a positive way as well since we first were dealing with this and had that full lockdown back in February and March earlier this year. I think it is right that we work across the private sector in partnership with the public sector to see the inroads we're seeing and the workers you touched on a few moments ago with Bernard around the vaccine as well. That's coming through because of that partnership between the public and the private sector. I just want to uh, ask you about some reports that are in the newspapers uh, today. Reports that the government is looking at cutting the 14-day isolation period if someone in your household uh, has got COVID or if you're travelling from abroad to 10 days, potentially even seven days. Is that true? Well, we're looking at the moment, the teams are looking at what we can do around those isolation periods. This will be scientifically led. As I say, we're learning more about the virus every single day. It's still a relatively new virus in terms of disease. And as we learn and the scientists are able to gauge us, we can look at whether we're able to reassess that. We're not ready to make a final decision or announcement on that yet, but we want to make sure we're moving with the science. And indeed, again, allowing people to live and work within this virus as best as we can, whilst always making sure we protect people's health and the NHS. Is it not just about the science, though? Is it also about the fact that you're worried people are just not following the rules? No, this is going to be scientifically liaised. We've always said we want to make sure we get the balance right. We want to protect lives, protect our NHS, ensure that it can continue to deal with the issues that, that it has, as, well, as it will it? have through the winter. Yeah. But also making sure that our economy can continue to develop and grow and that people can, as far as we possibly can within the constraints of the safety we have to follow with this virus, live as close to a normal life as we can as we get forward to a point where we can go back to living a normal life. That does mean that while we've got this virus and as we are putting those guidance points in place, that we all follow the guidance to the best of our ability to ensure that we're keeping not just ourselves but our communities safe from the virus where we can. So uh, is it also right that uh, company bosses, city bankers might actually be exempt from the same rules that everyone else has to follow uh, to try and promote global Britain, as reported by the Sunday Times. Is that really true? Uh, no, no, it's not. I have to say any changes that are made will apply to everybody. Obviously, there are things we've done through the virus, like getting testing out to frontline NHS workers first. It's properly led, again, by scientific and medical need. But when we look at things like that, that if there's any changes of that type, it will apply to everybody. OK. Uh, now, we've got to talk about free school meals. I have to say, it feels like you've drawn the short straw this morning. You're the minister who has been wheeled out to defend the government's policy and explain why it is that, that you don't want to fund meals for poor children uh, over the holidays. Have you done something wrong in a past life? Well, I always see it as a positive if I get to spend the first part of my Sunday chatting with you, Sophie, as I did a few weeks ago. I, I think, actually, our, our policy on this is... I know this is a very emotive issue, it's a sensitive issue and it's something that affects families in my constituency as well as around the country. I think the position we have taken is the right position because what we're looking to do is ensure we deal with child poverty at the core and put the structure in place that means even in school holidays children can get access to the food that they need. Uh, enjoyed the flattery uh, in the answer, but sadly it's not going to make me move off the topic that quickly. Um, I'm genuinely trying to work out why the government is opposing this. Is it because it's too expensive? Or because, is it because you don't agree with the principle of it? Well, actually, Sophie, I would say the premise of your question is, is not entirely right. First of all, we support free school meals. They've been in place since 1906, and we as a government have had them. I'm asking you about We're in a different school. place to that. Well, well, obviously, by definition, schools are not open in the holidays. So we're in a different place to where we were earlier in the summer, where we had the full lockdown and schools were closed. 99% are now open and they're going into that period of school holiday. The schools are closed. So it's what do we have in place when schools are closed? We've already put that facility in place. We've increased universal credit so people have got more support, over £1,000 on average across the country for the year. But we've also put in place around £63 million to support local authorities to help people in their communities at a time of hardship. Very specifically, to allow local authorities, they know their areas best, they're closest to the residents that they serve, and they can put in place the schemes that they feel can make sure that people who need that extra support, very targeted and very directly, can get that support. We're seeing councils around the country doing that for this week very directly. The campaign's been driven by Marcus Rashford, the Manchester United footballer, and it does really feel that he's touched a nerve. Uh, Bernard Jenkin even saying uh, that the government's misjudged the mood of the country on this. 
Sky News understands Boris Johnson didn't reply to a personal letter sent by the footballer in September. Shouldn't the Prime Minister at least meet with Marcus Rashford and his task force now? Well, I've got to say, I think Marcus Rashford has run a campaign that's clearly inspired people across the country. A huge credit to him for that. I mean, it's a phenomenal thing to raise the profile in the way that he has about child poverty. And he has got such a clear passion and understanding of that situation. I congratulate him for that. And actually, all those organisations out there that are rallying to the cause to work and help and support people in their communities. As I say, our position as a government is that we support that. We're doing that ourselves and we're putting that money in place for local authorities to be able to support those most in need. And the welfare system through the universal credit system as well is putting that extra support in so people can ensure that they can feed their families properly and healthily through the school holidays. And obviously when schools are in place, free school meals are there. Do you get the sense that you'd be wheeled out to defend this policy only for an inevitable U-turn to come? So, so the road noise, I missed the second part of that question. Do you get the sense that you've been wheeled out to defend this policy only for the government to inevitably U-turn on it? Actually, I think the, the, the idea for the government is to make sure we've got a, a holistic structure in place to make sure we are supporting those families and those children most in need at all times. That's what levelling up in our manifesto is all about, to ensure that we can improve education opportunities, improve job opportunities, hugely important, obviously, post-COVID in the future as well. And the structure we have put in place with the welfare system, as I say, through local authorities, through the universal credit system, means that that money and that support is there for people who are most in need in the school holidays. We fully support free school meals and have continued to deliver them and will continue to do so. And in the holidays, that's what the welfare system is there for, to ensure that people who need that help can get it. And I think we've done that in a very targeted way that means that people who need that support can access it in their local areas. OK, OK, let's move on. Um, Brexit talks are still uh, going on. Uh, how would you rate the chances of a deal? Well, I'm hopeful we will get a deal. I think we'll be ready as a country for whatever happens. I think whether we get a Canada-style or the Australian-style deal, we've been doing a huge amount of work, and businesses as well, to be ready for January. I think we will be, and there's big opportunities for us as a country as we go forward. But the teams are now back in that intensive negotiation, and hopefully there will be a positive outcome with a deal that means we trade on Canada-style deal. But Australia will work for us as well. Australia is no deal. Let's, let's say what it is. It's not an Australia deal, is it? It's no deal. Well, we already have a deal. Don't forget, we've left the European Union. We're in a transition process. What deal does Australia we've have with the, the EU? EU? The withdrawal yeah. agreement. We've got a protocol that means there is a structure there already of a deal. That means it's not no deal. That's just not correct, Sophie, I'm afraid. But look, we want to get a deal. We want to get a deal that means that we can continue to trade with a free trade agreement with our friends and partners in the EU. But we've got to do so in a way that is, yes, it's got to be good for our partners who trade with us. But obviously, as the UK government, we've got to make sure that's a deal that's right and appropriate for a sovereign country here in the UK. See, it's amazing, really, isn't it? You know, the government made a big deal of calling off the talks, saying it was all over, and now the talks are magically back on. You're saying you're hopeful that you're going to get a deal. I mean, you must be really flabbergasted by this surprising turn of events. No, I think, look, these are negotiations. The, we, we were very clear, we're only going to do a deal if it's a deal that's right and good and positive for the UK. We want to have one that works with our trading partners around the world and obviously in the EU. And it's good that Michel Barnier has come back to the table and is saying that they are prepared to have a look at what they could do, because the EU does need to move. We've been very clear, we'll only do a deal if it's right for the United Kingdom. OK, um, just finally, I've done a film this week, we're going to watch it a bit later in the programme. It's about the way that maternity services have been impacted during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. I spoke to one woman who gave birth just two weeks ago without her husband there. Um, many women also not able to take their partners to important scan appointments as well. Uh, and one hospital in Liverpool uh, now tightening up restrictions as cases rise. Um, how is it acceptable for women to have to labour go to important scan appointments without any support there? Look, I know how difficult these situations can be. Obviously, I've, I've got children been through this experience myself. I was fortunate enough that obviously it was pre-COVID, so in the uh, more normal times kind of rules. And people want that kind of support around them. We want people to have that support around them. But obviously, we've got to look at what is safe for the families and for the NHS workers as we're dealing with this virus as well. And it's getting the balance of that right in a way that means that we can move forward and that families can have a safe birth and that our NHS workers are safe as well.